your situation may be bad. It may not be exactly where you want it to be. Um, if you can still be in a place of service, uh, you'll, you'll get everything, you know, you'll, you'll get everything that you desire just because your, your, your heart is already of a. Hello and welcome to the Building Men Podcast. My name is Dennis Moralda. Building Men is geared toward helping you become the strongest version of yourself mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. So this is a ceremonial episode right now. We just started the Building Men YouTube channel. We got it up and running. It was like this morning on the East Coast. And uh, I was just talking to my guest TJ about this. And I was basically saying, um, you know, you're going to be the first, you know, YouTube guest is now that we know that it's going live, we get to make sure that we don't have anything in our nose and <laughs> things like that. So I wanted to welcome um, everyone uh, to uh, Thomas Jacobs. So Thomas is the host of the Finding Rib Rhythm podcast. He's an actor, he's an artist, he's an educator, he's an entrepreneur. Um, listen, he's probably a, a, gives a really good back rub too. I mean, you look like you got some strong hands there, my man. So, uh, I just wanted to welcome you to the building man podcast. And, uh, it's really good for you to, to be here on the first uh, official YouTube, uh, you know, inaugural episode here. Dennis, my man, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. So I was on your podcast, finding rhythm. Um, yes. we, we hooked up about two weeks ago. And so I got to know you a little bit during that process. And just from the questions that you were asking me, I was able to ascertain a little bit about your journey, your story, and your mission to really help people. You're like a renaissance man. You're doing, you have uh -huh. your hands in a, a little bit of everything, which I can certainly <laughs> appreciate right now. And you're helping people understand what their mission is to help them mm -hmm. kind of figure out their flow or their rhythm in life. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think that we connected right away because I feel like we're both on that. We're on parallel journeys in what we're doing right now. Absolutely. So if you wouldn't mind, Thomas, if you could just tell us a little bit about, pick up any point along your journey. Um, it could be your, you know, your upbringing, your, you know, your career in, in education, maybe uh, after educate or after your, you know, high school career into college, just as a spot that you want to pick out wherever you want to start on your journey and lead us from a, a spot on your journey into kind of how you became this, you know, this entrepreneur, this coach, this um, actor, uh, podcast host. Yeah. So pick out the journey wherever you want to start it. All right, absolutely. So um, I am originally from Fredericksburg, Virginia. It's a small town right in between Washington, DC and Richmond, uh, Virginia. So we're like the, the meeting point. Um, but growing up in a small town, I always wanted to just uh, be the best version of myself and, and growing up in a household where uh, my, my immediate parents um, didn't really go to college. My dad went to military. Um, and my mom was tagging along with them, right? So um, the dream of, of schooling and, and secondary school was never talked about. Um, and I, I remember I, uh, vividly in, in my senior year in high school, where I'm kind of like, I don't really know what I want to do, but I know that I want to get out of here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't want to spend my time in Fredericksburg. So um, I was like, I'm going to go to school. I don't know. I don't know what I want to major in. Um, so there was just a lot of uncertainty as I'm approaching um, going to college and so you know my parents are just like hey you just gotta go just go just go to college you, you'll figure it out right so it's kind of like just the push yeah and then and then you'll figure it out right so so but then that's when the journey started where I um, graduated from um, high school and then I went into um, undergrad at VCU in, in Richmond and so it was just really interesting and that's why um, my work is really aligned with uh, what I'm passionate about it's and, and it's spreading the knowledge to high school, uh, especially the youth about getting clear on on what they want to do, especially when it goes when it comes to college, um, even if you don't know, but knowing that one of the biggest dream killers is debt. And so um, I, I, I did a TED talk, um, TEDx talk about um, the, the problem of debt within our society and how a lot of high schoolers are graduating, you know, and I'm, I'm not sure I'm not sure if you like graduated with a, a big number of debt, but like, a lot of high schoolers are graduating, going into college, and we're not having these conversations about right. the, the problems of student loan debt and how, you know, if, if you're going to enter a career field, there's, there's going to be a certain amount of years that's going to take for you to pay that off. 
Um, so that was me in a, in a nutshell. And that's, and that's my journey. And that's what I really like have been aligned with um, within my work. Undergrad was great. I loved it. Um, I eventually graduated. And then I realized um, I, I, I majored in criminal justice. And uh, I, I graduated. That's when no, no jobs were <laughs> available. And I'm like, I don't want to do this. Like, I, I want to do something that I'm passionate about. I had, I had, I remember sitting on my, um, my couch at my parents' house and just figuring out, all right, so what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Um, so then I was just like, I was listening to a lot of podcasts at that time. Um, I was listening to, I was reading books. I was just trying to fill my, my head up with as much information as I could. Um, reading like Richard Branson biographies, reading, um, just, just trying to study just so many greats that I could. And then I, and then I was like, you know what, I'm just going to, we're just gonna start my own company. Um, I'm a choreographer. I, I do acting, so the arts is is, is my like um, is is my outlet for me. It's always been my outlet, especially in Fredericksburg. Um, so I started that. We did a lot of great things. Um, that's that's when I did a TED talk, uh, like a, a couple years later, doing that, and then we did like perform. We worked with the Wizards a lot. So, but then afterwards, I was like, all right, so now it's time for me to grow as a as an artist, as an educator. So um, I transitioned to New York City and then to pursue my artistry up here a lot more. So it, it's, it's, been, it's been great ever since, but I, I've, been learning, I've been learning a lot of nooks and crannies along the way. So I'll start with the idea of financial literacy with kids in mm -hmm. school. I'm so interested in people's journeys in education. It could be in elementary and middle and high school. And building men, one of the things that I want to understand is, are people coming out of school with true building blocks to be successful in their future is is the school system providing students what they absolutely need or is it we're kind of checking off boxes things that they need to do within whatever the prescribed curriculum that you know the local um you know school boards of education are telling people that they have to telling kids that they have to do during this period of time are we truly teaching kids these long lasting life skills that will serve them or or kind of help them understand what it means to be a man or a woman in society today. So I'm fascinated about that idea of financial literacy. Literacy. That's one thing I remember. I, I might have taken a business class in high school at some point, but I don't feel like I came out of high school with any idea of what was going on or what I needed to do. And I went right. to college. My parents did the best that they possibly could um, to help me out along the way, but I came out of out of college with a substantial debt as well, you know, and now I'm starting out as a teacher, knowing that, you know, not only do I have to do this, this and this, I also have these student loan payments for the next 15, 20 years of my life before I'm ever making any money. Yeah. So as mm -hmm. I listen to you talk about financial literacy with kids, what could what could the school system have done better to prepare you to be successful post high school and then post college? Uh it's it's such a it's such a good question, but it's it's I feel like it's so layered because um, I feel just having a realistic conversation about what money is, right? Because we don't we don't know. We're we're yeah. we're, we're coming out of high school and we're like, yeah, I want to do this. I want I want to do that. I mean, and then to be completely honest, I was I was fair, I was I was being um, I wasn't being frugal with the money, right? So I was I was just I, I I was getting student loans and I was I was using it to pay for rent. Um, which, which is, I, I, I take full accountability for that, you know, um, but that was my, that was due to my own ignorance as far as um, financial literacy. And when it comes to student loans and it comes to um, college and, and covering all of those costs, because I, I never had the conversation about um, what it should look like when you're budgeting, um, housing, lodging, food, and all of these other things. So I think that what should be offered now is really like a sit down conversation about what you're getting into for the next four years. It's not only a commitment with your journey, right? It's not only a commitment with, this, with deciding what you want to do for the rest of your life, technically, but it's also you're making a financial burden and a commitment and just being mindful and cognizant of what you're signing on for. Do you think that um, college is for everyone? I mean, in your, in your uh, perspective, you know, you're an, an actor, an entrepreneur, an artist, a teacher. I remember growing up, it was just like you, you needed to go to college. I graduated high school in 1995. It was like, okay, college is the next step. Um, so I'm curious to see what you think about if you were giving advice to someone who's 17, 18 years old, and they're unsure right now, is college for everyone? I think, I think that the, tradi the traditional route is not for everyone. Um, but I do feel that if you really do want to be a doctor, 
right? Or you really do want to be a teacher, then it, it 100% makes sense for you to um, spend money to invest in this, then this road and this trajectory. But if you're, if you're unsure, um, I, I encourage you to, to get to know yourself some more, get to know what it is that you really truly want to spend and do the rest of your life because you're paying time, right? Like you're, like you're going to spend a lot of time to study, to, to do all these things, but then you're also going to pay later on down the road. Um, if you're just unsure, you know, and I'm all for people, you know, with self-discovery, with personal growth and development, reading books, listening to audio books, listening to podcasts, um, trying to gain as much information as you possibly can. You can learn how to do a lot of things on YouTube, but I don't want someone, um, you know, giving me a, you know, a, you know, prostate exam that's learning how to do it on YouTube. That's not <laughs> something that I'm, I'm interested in. So yeah, I totally absolutely. agree. There are certainly times when you need that those that certificate, those letters behind your name, if you're going to be doing something that's a little bit more in detail. But I also believe my journey has led me to the to the um, to the epiphany, I guess, that it's so important to have role models, mentors, coaches yeah. in your life. Um, you know, maybe people that you want to aspire to be one day, but also people that are maybe a step or two ahead of you that were just recently in the spot where you are now that can yep. kind of reach a hand back and say, hey, let me help you all along on this journey. Mm -hmm. So now there's someone who is, um, you know, going through something that you went through when you were a, um, a senior in high school. So you went to VCU and that kind of led you on this path. What did you study at VCU? What was your major? Uh, I studied criminal justice. Okay. Yeah. So I originally wanted to be a lawyer. <laughs> right. Okay. So criminal justice led you down this path of, was it, was it your experience? Did you join a club? Was it just, you know, your true personality came out when you're like, this is not the authentic me. You, you know, and it, it, it took, I, I wish I would have just trusted my instinct because when I'm in classes, it, I, it, the conversations were just different from my classmates. Right. Um, but I always was an artist and I just, I, and I adopted the, um, the notion, uh, from, from my parents listening to, listening to, um, others around me, oh, you can't do that. You can't make that a, um, you can't make that happen. That's not gonna work. How, how, like, you know, so I'm, I'm just in taking so much doubt and taking um, so much fear into my own journey and my own path that I was like, okay, well, this is what I need to do. And so it took, it took for me to graduate to actually realize, you know what? Um, I, it was one moment that I remember um, distinctly where I went to for an interview at Geico and <laughs> great commercials. And, yeah great commercials right <laughs> so i went i went to the interview and i'm just like you know i i need to get a job i have all these loans and uh i sat down with the managers and it was for like a, a good position and they were just like we're looking at your resume and it's just like it's not going to be a good fit just be, just like you're over you know and that's what's happening yeah. like you're, you're graduating you're overqualified for these positions but they know that you know probably within a year or two i'm quite, probably going to like transition and leave um so that that was a big indicator to me. I was just looking at signs. It was just signs for me. And I'm just like, okay, all right. So let me just let me just look at what's working for me and what I can do with my own community and build my own community up um, and, and just be of service. So, so, isn't it funny that it's insurance companies that have the best commercials? As you were talking about, like Geico, <laughs> State Farm, Progressive. Yeah. Those are the ones that like those are the the commercials that you would you kind of pick out in your mind that are, you know, decent, funny commercials. Who would have right. thought it was the insurance companies that are, that are bringing it in the, you know, in crunch time. So now <laughs> you're, you have this moment where you're like, all right, I, I, um, in, in my high school career, this is what I thought I was going to be. I graduated with a degree in criminal justice. It has this specific path ahead of you in criminal justice. And you're like, you know what, this is not, this is not me. This is not what I believe in. And so this, to me, this is the crux of, what I love to talk to people about is this moment now, just, I was trying to figure out where that moment was for you. So now you're at this point where you're like, okay, this isn't me. I don't get the job at Geico and I'm, you know, now I need to kind of reinvent and figure myself out. Some people in that position would be like, I'm just going to take whatever job comes about. I'm just going to kind of trudge through. I got a degree in criminal justice. I might as well do something in that line. But you went through this process of, of reinventing yourself. And in the beginning, I kind of mentioned everything that you're doing, and I would consider you to be a renaissance man. You were, you were kind of involved in everything. And one of your things is you want to learn as much as you can from other people and help them find their particular way. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So now you're at this point where you're not quite sure what you want to do. How did you get from there to now you're in New York and you're like, you know, I'm going to be an actor. I'm going to try to expand my horizons a little bit. So how did that journey go from that point to from where you were to to landing in New York? Right. Um, So I was I was listening to podcasts, uh, like I said, when I was um, at at my parents' house and and staying there. And I just I just want to like just touch on that moment because um, you know, I have my dad on my back, like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? And so, and so even if you haven't already, um, established that relationship between, you know, you want to be a man, you want to be, you you know, you're like, this is, this is my choice. This is what I decided to do. Like, you know, like dad, it's okay. Get off my back. But, um, but I, I, I just, I just trusted it where I, uh, I was listening to, I think Alan Watts, he was like, if, if, if money was no object and, and that, that poem just came in, just kept reciting in my head, if money was no object, um, what would you do? And so I was like, you know what, I, 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 I do have this debt, but I have nothing to lose. So, um, I just, I just started doing what excited me, what, what I was excited about, um, and, and, and what was bringing me more joy, you know, and, and I'm seeing, I'm seeing the way that, you know, some of my family members, the, the road that they have went down and like, not as exciting. Um, and I'm just like, I'm just going to do it. So I, I just, I started my company up. Um, and then that all, and ever since I did that, literally I was connected to something, right. I was connected to, to a sense of purpose. And I think that's what I, I really found my why in that. And so I think after I found my why, um, all the other doors just kept opening up and it was just like a, a step, another step, and then another step and then another step. You know, I, I, I was in DC. So like, I, I kind of like was in DC and, and um, Fredericksburg a lot. And I did a lot of things for both of those communities when it comes for the arts. Um, and two, I got to a point where I was like, all right, so, so now there's another step that, that I need to take. So that's how I ended up um, working with education in, in New York City. I think you hit on a good point there. I think we're so focused on the act of doing that we don't consider being. Mm. We're so it's so like, oh, what do I have to do next? What do I have to do next? And I'm all for these daily habits, these things that we do on a regular basis. I'm more thinking big picture. What most men are like, well, what do you tell me about yourself? Well, you talk about your job first. Well, this is what I do. Where what you're right. doing is you're helping people understand what they need to be. Mm. And then that will lead them down the right path, especially if you're trying to get people to follow along on your journey, you need to be authentic and believe in what that whatever that is, whatever, whatever your call your specific calling in life is, you need to be it. And then, you know, start doing it. And then people will follow along on that journey. So you mentioned there, I put it in quotes, I'm jotting down notes, you said, you know, as you were thinking about your conversation with your father it was like, be a man. So I'm really interested. It's a part of my journey in building men is to really understand what that means to different people, all, you know, the people that I speak to, what does masculinity mean? What does be a man mean? So, you know, you've talked to your father about it and that was something that came up was being a man. So what does being a man mean to you? Yeah. So, um, and this is, and it, it, it gets kind of tricky or a little bit heavy, but, uh, yeah. when it, and this is something that I've been unpacking in my current stage where I'm at, um, where I've been asking my father questions about how he's perceived his father and how he's perceived by his mother. Um, and I, I literally just sent them a message uh, last week. And I was like, can you just tell me five qualities or characteristics, good or bad, of like yeah. some of your, some of the people who have influenced you. And it was written like, it, it was actually, it was so great. It was so great because he was able to open up in a way that I've never seen him open up. Right. And um, through text, which is fine. Uh, Everybody has a different relationship with their father and them. But through this, I learned that um, me and my dad have not always had a close relationship. Right. Um, But I learned that because his father and him did not have a close relationship. Right. So he's just mimicking the relationship that he saw from his father. Right. And so um, being aware being cognizant of like who who you are and 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 your journey and doing like the work doing personal development doing uh you know doing the work that you're doing um i couldn't hold him accountable or responsible for any of like the actions that he has failed to uh to do throughout my life you know um so i I saw that moment i was like wow okay so so you're only doing the best that you can do because you are looking at the models before you Right. So I'm like, okay, 
all right. So, so now it's my responsibility to, uh, to dive in deep into, to help you along with, with some of those areas for us to have a better relationship. But when it comes to masculinity, um, and what does it mean to be a man? I, it's, it's what you, it's, it's what I have perceived from him with our actions, right? Like, so I guess like the, the father is the one who provides for the household. The father is the one who is, who's hard and stern regardless. The father is the one who yells. And um, I mean, and, th and this is just the example that I've seen, right? The father is the one who um, gets everybody in, in order. Um, tough love, like we, like we don't, we don't really show affection, you know? So just a lot of these things that, that I, that I noticed it's, it's, some of these things are, are not really uh, valid because it, it was learned from a not so uh, reasonable structure, if that, if that makes sense. It um, does, it does. And so you're taking a lot of those qualities, that kind of stoic, traditional head of household masculine role uh, that helped you define what masculinity means. Yeah. I did the same thing and it's interesting. Um, I had my father on, for episode one, it was my, my brother, Anthony, and I interviewed my dad. I'll release episode. We, there was just so much there that after yeah. 45 minutes, we got through like the first 20 years of his life. And I was like, I wasn't even born yet in, in this journey. So we need to revisit this in the future. Yeah. But it was so interesting to ask those questions that I might not have asked before, but doing it in a format where I was able to learn a lot about why he acted the way he, that he did in certain situations or, you know, why our relationship was such a way for, for a period of time, but doing it on the podcast was such a cool thing. And I would, you know, um, who knows if your father would be interested in doing it. You said you communicate a lot via text, but what it did was it helped me understand him, but it also created this time stamped moment that, you know, my kids, my grandkids, it's a, right. it's a moment where they can go back and listen to this conversation. It can help them yeah. understand maybe why they are acting in a certain way. Um, it, it was, it was an idea that was shared with me, um, by Ian Lobos, who does the men on purpose podcast. Mm. He interviewed me and he was telling me, I, I talk to my dad every couple months and a lot of stuff comes up and I ask him these questions. And the other thing that stuck out to me, um, TJ, when you were talking about that was you don't blame your dad for those things that happened. That was how he was raised. That was how he was taught to show up based on his relationship with his father and probably his father's father, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But what, what was so um, interesting to me and so such an insightful comment was it's all that that only works until the point where you are able to com communicate with them you know dad this is why it's not okay like i need us to talk on this level and i need to understand you to understand that you know we can communicate on a different level and you could be vulnerable with me and i could be vulnerable with you um so that's the that to me that's the most um, amazing part of that whole journey that you just took me on there was the conversation that happens after that point, mm -hmm. you know, when you're able to bring them back in. So those are the things that you, you feel like you got from your father, as far as masculinity is concerned. Is there any things that you learned what not to do? You know, like I could, you know, I could learn a lot about, you know, a way not to be a, you know, a race car driver. You know, I could, I could learn how not to do that by standing on the corner on route 130. Well, I need to learn from someone who's really doing it in the right way. So is there, are there things that he showed you, maybe taught you, maybe you saw from him that you're like, you know what, that's not going to be the way I am when I am, you know, leading people in the future. Yeah. Um, and I, I, th I think that was a, one of the um, most influential roles for me growing up as a young male where, um, you know, he, there were certain decisions and choices that he made. Uh, and understanding him now, I'm, I, I, like I said, I was able to forgive him for a lot of the, I mean, it, it wasn't, it wasn't anything bad, right? But, um, but as, as far as showing up, um, it, it just was, it was very tough for the family for him to show up in the, in the capacity that, that he could. So I always would say, I don't want to be like that. Like if there was a decision like that, I, I, I'll be honest, he was an alcoholic. Um, and so he's, he recovered. Uh, so he, I, I'm very proud of him, right? But there was still some, you know, that, that still had an effect on the family and an effect on decision making when it comes to um, our childhoods, right? But I would always say, I don't want to be like that. And, then, and I, I don't want to do that. And so that's probably why like his route was like the military. I was like, nope, <laughs> right, right. I'm not going to do military. So I'm going to, so I'm going to figure, I'm going to figure something else out. And I know that I will be guided and trusted throughout whatever, I, whatever I do. So, um, so yeah. So when it comes to, that answers it. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And it's, I've gone through that same journey as well. And you get to a point in your own personal growth and development where you can start to 
forgive you know it's like they right. did the best that they could with what they knew at that time but it's the conversation that happens afterwards it's like that's the that's where growth actually happens i know now i'm i'm closer with my father than i had have ever been in my whole entire yeah. life and a lot of it was because of those difficult conversations that we had that i didn't think i would be able to have those conversations but once they start i'm like you know what i'm just going to push my chips in because it it's not going to strain it'll, it'll it might be difficult initially but it'll help us grow you know as a father and son and, and hopefully it'll help me be a better father for my own son as well yep. so now talk to me a little bit about um you know a little bit what you you were talking about is like this idea of, of being stuck and being kind of you know pigeonholed into something that maybe you were you you studied in school or where your family prescribed you you're supposed to be doing this our family does this our family does that that hit home with me i felt like there was a time where I was supposed to take over the family business. That was just what I was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And when I went in another direction, I kind of felt I, I was, I was breaking the rules in some way. So you talk to people a lot about getting unstuck at a spot in their life. So people that, that feel like they're stuck, how do you, how do you talk to people or how do you help people gain more of that kind of natural flow in their life where they don't feel like they have to be stuck in this prescribed way? Yeah. So, um, I, as a, as working with movement and, and seeing movement and working with, you know, doing theater, doing uh, dance, you know, movement is all around us. And so it's, it's, it's pretty clear to unpack and unbreak some things. Um, and I almost look at it as a, as a dam, right? And so a, a beaver and how a beaver builds up a dam, it's putting wood towards the dam and like blocking the flow of the river, right? So um, I view that as like action. And, and sometimes it's like, some action steps that that we're, that we're putting that's kind of blocking the flow in a certain way, and um, they call it like paradigm shifts, where uh, it, it's it, their habit series of habits that we've been doing and that we're we're getting accustomed to doing that we haven't really unpacked that hey maybe this routine is not working for us, um, and so I, I kind of explain it as taking small action steps towards getting bigger momentum, right? Um, for instance, when I first moved to New York, I was uh, working at a charter school and, and it was just so foreign to me, just, you know, going from artists to like <laughs> workforce, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and so like, you know, I just, I, I just knew, I knew I was ready for a routine, but I, I, I didn't have a, a routine. I'm just showing up at work. Um, I, I'm, I'm literally just like on the train. Um, it's, it, you're seeing everybody around you. Like, we're all just so miserable, <laughs> you know? And I'm just like. I'm like, ah, no, nah, no. Like, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna exercise my mind. Like, I'm gonna journal when I'm on the train. I'm gonna like, I'm gonna read some stuff. I'm gonna pull up Napoleon Hill. I'm gonna to like study some of the greats. I'm, I'm going to like be try to get my mind on like a exercise and and try to get into a journey of productivity, um, as opposed to just and and, and but I I felt I just felt stuck for a while. I felt stuck for a while. I gained like, I gained weight. Um, I just, I, I didn't recognize myself. Um, but then I was like, you know, I, I'm the only person that can, that can save me right now. So I have to be the one responsible and accountable to get myself out of it. You know, like I, I'm trying to pay off these student loans and then I'm, I'm depressed because I have the student loans, but I'm like, I take accountability for the student loans. I forgive myself, yep. pay it off, you know? And so like, um, and so I, I think a lot of it is getting to know yourself, getting to know yourself, um, journal, meditate, uh, do some, do some activities that are really going to help you get to know who you are in order to change who you are. Uh, if you don't like where you're at. You, that was the moment that I was waiting for is where you were at that point where you looked and you were like, what am I doing? I don't like who I'm seeing right now. And there's such a difference between there's some routines that are so positive in nature when it is, it's a routine that is, and I like I use the word routine. It's a daily habit. It's something that you kind of put in place. It's getting up early. It's meditating, journaling, exercising, taking cold showers, you know, your nutrition, whatever those things are that you're doing on a regular basis that are um, helping you become better. The other conversely, the other side of the routine is kind of like I look at just these, you know, people that are like zombies. They're like, oh, man, it's Monday morning. I got to go to work right now. I've, you know, grab a coffee and a bagel on the way to work. You got to sit in your office for 15 minutes before you can talk to it. just because it's this like monotonous cycle of, you know, boredom that people are not having anything that kind of sparks their interest or helps them become better. So that like, I look at routines in two different ways. One of those positive routines that are really helping you become better. And the other ones are just when life becomes routine, 
when it's not a routine that's serving you, when routine is something that you're doing in your life, that's where you have to look at yourself and say, okay, what can I do now? And so your podcast is called Finding Rhythm. So now you're talking to a 6'4", 220 pound woman. <laughs> Maybe if I get a couple drinks in me, I could you know, attempt some some moves on the dance That's floor. Good. Maybe <laughs> attempt some, you know, some semblance of rhythm. So talk yeah. to me about where finding rhythm came from. Where did you come up with that idea? Um, so it, it originally was from my from the TED talk that I did, and um, the funny thing is that I'm giving I'm giving this talk as I'm about to move to New York. <laughs> to go into what I didn't know what I was getting right. into, wow. you know? And so that's the, that's the crazy thing about it, where it's just like, I'm, I'm, I'm taught, it was a, it was, it was a group of um, high school, it was a group of youth. So they're graduating high school and um, we were all talking to them, but I, I'm, t- I'm saying this, but I wish I would have been more authentic, right. As, as far as like what they actually like, Hey, I, I'm I'm in this position. I don't know what I'm about to go do. Like you know, I know I don't know what I'm getting myself into. Um, but so that's where finding rhythm came in. But then I, afterwards, I just realized, and working with so many artists up here in New York City, and working with um, my, some of my mentors who just always talk about um, very you know philosophical ways of 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 life. They're they're like copywriters. They study um, different forms of like martial arts. And so I was kind of like, let me. Let, I'm going to reapproach this in a different way and, and, and talk about how rhythm is something that is involved in our everyday routine. Like it's, it's all around us. To me that, I mean, it's such an amazing thing. So you did a TEDx talk before you actually did it almost. So you were, it was like ready, fire, aim. You were like, I'm, <laughs> like, I'm telling you everything about it before I've actually done it. I mean, one, I, that might be the title of this, of this episode or something, but just because it's such an interesting thing to me, you believed in yourself. And once other people see you believing in you and where you're going, they're going to believe in you. It's right. it's one of those things. So you're able to take those steps. Um, and that's another com- commonality as I'm talking to people. You actually have to start doing. Like mm-hmm. it has to go, you have to be, you have to understand like I want to make these changes, go inward. And then you have to start moving even if you're not ready. You got to, a couple of people told me I was ready to, you know, start some things with building men. I wanted to do an online course. I wanted to do this. I wanted to, people are like, listen, you got to, you got to take that move first. Um, I remember a guy told me, you got to put out your first shit version, whatever it is. And it doesn't matter how bad it is, but you have to prove to yourself that you can at least do it. Mm -hmm. And then you'll say, okay, that didn't kill me. I was able to get through it. I learned some things and now I'll get better at it moving forward. So that's what you did. You were like, I'm going to go ahead and do this. So now you're in this, this spot where you're like, okay, this finding rhythm, it, it, it speaks to me. It means something to me. So now you're, you're working with people that are trying to find rhythm, find flow, find joy in your yeah. life. So how does that look? So now people want to, you know, to work with you to help them kind of get out of that unstuck spot. What does that look like? So basically um, explaining and, and unpacking ways that they're stuck, unpacking ways that, uh, you know, sometimes you have to talk some things out. Um, and then you, what you might realize, oh, um, I just got a dog and I, me and me and the dog are just having so many situations like like we're just not agreeing and then we start talking about um something with the goal and then we're seeing some common commonalities you know and then we're like okay so so what do you think this means and then like ways to uh like wait ways ways to really unpack that you know and 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 get some get get some flow moving so maybe like maybe we need to approach this a little bit differently um and and offering some more joy because the dog is there for joy but we're we're not able to find the joy into our other other field what would you say is the most common thing that you run into as far as people feeling stuck is it in their job is it with a relationship is it just their overall happiness in life like what's one thing that you would say like listen this is something that comes up at least 75 percent of the time i would say i would say the routine routine yeah. and so somebody comes to you they're they're kind of unsure of what to do with their routine how do you help them kind of go to the next step without giving away your secret sauce right now like what is, <laughs> what are, how do you go about it kind of helping people along that way? Um, I definitely would say it, it's, it starts in the morning because the, the, the morning is the first is the first thing that all your thoughts come to you. The morning is the first is the first time that you're actually able to uh, get up out of your bed. And then it's what you're about to do. So it's either you're going to like hit the snooze button. It's either you're going to roll over. It's either you're going to like, um, you know, kiss your loved one, call, call, call your kids up. Um, 
you're going to invite love into your experience or you're going to get on Instagram, right? Or you're going to like get on social media and then, and then enter and then allow other thoughts to enter your own experience right before you're even about to take on the day. And especially if you're, if you're going to work, right? And so I think that um, that's a whole nother different dynamic where um, if you're going to a nine to five, um, I, I strongly encourage um, having some moments to yourself before you start to go to work for somebody else, right? Isn't it amazing that, so say people that are going to a nine, nine to five and they have a bit of a commute, there's so much time, if, if you just kind of get into that routine of, of getting up at whatever time, 5 a.m., Sure. And so that sounds crazy to some people. Some people are just like, yeah, I do that anyway. But the amount of time that you have for yourself, you know, between 5 a.m. and 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, and then after you're home from work, you might have to do some things, some obligations for your family, but maybe between 8 and 10, you have some time for yourself as well. The amount of time that people spend letting others control their thought process, you know, through social media, through Netflix, through whatever. I, and I'm a... a, a guilty of that. Uh, there was mm -hmm. such a long period of my life for years. While I was always relatively healthy, I would go to the gym, I would do certain things here and there, but I was never kind of committed to it. But I would always get up early. I would get up at five, but a lot of those 5 a.m. wake ups was I would sit in the living room with a cup of coffee, watching the news for an hour and a half, yeah. doing some scrolling on social media. Then I would get to work and kind of do the same thing at night. I would, you know, mess, watch you know, a couple shows on TV, Netflix, watch the, you know, watch a game, but it was nothing that was helping me develop as a person or help other people. So I'll kind of use it as a segue into your, one of the things that I love about you too, is you you have this mission to be in service of other people. So talk to me a little bit about why do you think that that, that is how you are? Was it anything in your past that you saw someone, a mentor, someone that, that you want to emulate helping other people? And how is that just part of your, of your life and your daily routine now? Yeah. Um, so there's a, a really quick story. Um, growing up, uh, I would, m my mom, she was very heavy in the church. Um, and so, but she was always the first person to just go and donate, like not donate her time to the homeless shelter um, in the area because there was somebody else in the church who was connected with that. So we would go and, and deliver food to the needy like every Tuesday or like every Friday. But to be honest with you, we were lower middle class. <laughs> so it's kind of like, military family where we we made enough but we didn't make enough to to qualify for some for some needs but i'm kind of like mom we're hungry too <laughs> like can, can we have some different food but but just just seeing her in that moment and seeing her being such a giver that really um stuck with me for for uh, up until now where i'm just like even though your situation may be bad it may not be exactly where you want it to be um if you can still be in a place of service uh, you'll, you'll get everything, you know, you'll, you'll get everything that you desire just because your, your, your heart is already of a being of a giver. Um, and so that's, that's always been something that's worked for me. Um, and I, and I know that a lot of entrepreneurs have talked about how, you know, even if you are working, um, you're doing something that you do enjoy, you know, but it's for somebody else. Uh, but you you don't really feel as aligned sometimes service and picking up, um, picking up like volunteer, volunteer work. Um, that's something that can connect you and something that can ground you. It's such an amazing thing to think about too. When people think about giving, typically people think about something financially. Yeah. Like you're giving back, so you're giving some financial resource to another person. Um, but I also think giving can be of your time. Like you mentioned, your mom was such an amazing role model for you and understanding that even though maybe you didn't you didn't have everything that you wanted and you desired, um, we are still in a spot where we are fortunate enough to be able to help another person. And then also giving even an, an acknowledgement to someone. TJ, I remember that I did a podcast. I, I was driving home, um, right? And I live in, in central New Jersey. So I was driving near Trenton, which is the capital of New Jersey. And Trenton is, um, it, it's it's a city area that has, you know, some really tough spots. And there were the, these men that stood out on the streets at a busy kind of intersection, just asking for help. And I remember that there was one day that I was driving by and there was a guy in front of me driving a, a BMW and he rolled down his window and he just threw French fries out at the guy, like just, uh, threw, and yeah. the guy like, he, and he like bent down and started picking them up. And I like tears started mm -hmm. flowing down my eye and I pulled off to the side of the road and I went out and I approached him. And at first he like backed away from me. Like I was going to, and he, I was like, listen, I just want to talk to you. I said, you know, what can I do to help you out right now? And I just remember we had this deep conversation about life and he said, 
the fact that you just acknowledge my presence, he said, there were so many people that, you know, he said, I'm in this really tough spot. I made a lot of bad decisions in my life. He said, but so many people will not even make eye contact with me and acknowledge mm -hmm. that I'm a human being. Mm -hmm. So even just that acknowledgement, um, you, you know, you can donate your time, you can donate your, your, your resources, but even just donating or acknowledging another human being's existence, sometimes that, that can make such a huge difference where they can then turn around. It'll make them feel a certain way that maybe they want to do something different or help someone else. It, it just has that ripple effect. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and I think even service does it, it doesn't look, it doesn't have to be like, you, like you said, financial, it doesn't have to be, uh, you're going to a, a, a shelter. To, to go donate your time. It can literally be just a moment, like what you said, but even um, spending time with uh, your, your, your niece and like literally taking time out of your busy schedule to acknowledge, hey, you're important, you matter, let's go get some ice cream. How was your day? How, how, how are you doing? You know, like, and, and, and that, that goes a long way for even other people as well. Yep. It's one of those things that people just, the, the fact that you're just acknowledging another person's existence on this planet that you're sharing the similar experience with and it's it also helps us realize that especially in today's climate like there are so many things that um that the media and that the world are telling us that we are not alike that people are so different but in ways when we we could kind of take a deep look into ourselves and say we want to help other people um, understand their value and truly acknowledge another person's existence. It kind of helps bring the world closer together and helps people understand, you know, we can help each other get better as well. Yes. So, so TJ, tell us a little bit about, about how we can, we can find you, your mission, you know, what are you up to right now? Tell us a little bit about, you know, how we kind of join along <laughs> on your journey. All right. So um, season two of Finding Rhythm Podcast is coming out. Uh, very excited. You are one of the featured guests as well. So um, be definitely you can follow us at Finding Rhythm Podcast on Instagram. And um, and I, I have a I have a lot I have a lot going on. I also am working with some artists in the area. We're doing some first in person work um that's going to be featured in like the new york times and some fun things so definitely follow us on finding rhythm um and excited <laughs> yeah and I i'm gonna introduce you to a guy who lives in perth australia oh. his name is ian DeMello. Okay. i had him on my podcast i forget it was like episode 44 45 something like that i'll share it with you he is a crump dancer Oh, I love crumb. Um, and he is just such an interesting human being, very, very motivational. And I connected with him and you kind of share the same space of, you know, physical movement, dance and motivation. So I'm going to connect the two of you together. It's, okay. I feel like it's, I just interviewed a guy, his name is Jamie Gruber. And his, and one of his, his things is about connecting people and just the responsibility yeah. that you feel when you see that two individuals in the world might be able to help each other in some way and then help other people. I've, I've definitely, I, after talking to you and talking to him, I'm going to connect the two of you together and I, I'll just kind of sit back and watch great things happen because now we're talking, it's a global experience. It's not yeah. just, we're talking about United States is this will be something global here. Absolutely. So TJ, thank you so much for being a part of um, Billy Men Podcast. I truly appreciate it. I have learned a lot from you just about the idea of helping yourself when you're going through a difficult time, when you're feeling that kind of stuck feeling, especially if you're just kind of trudging along in that like routine, what you can do to help get yourself out of that routine. And then what your journey as a Renaissance man um, has really helped you. you. You didn't stick to this prescribed path that was in front of you. You challenged things that people thought you should be doing and you took a risk. You bet on yourself and you were able to prevail. And now you're reaching back, helping other people come along on this journey. So it's been an enlightening experience for me. Truly appreciate the last you know hour or so getting to know you. And uh, I'd love to, to keep in touch and uh, continue to connect in the future. Yes, sir. Dennis, it was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. So to find Building Men Podcast, it's building.men on Instagram. We have a new YouTube channel. I will definitely put it up on in the show notes. Building Men Podcast on Facebook. We're going to try to just, you know, get everywhere. We'll see how it will yeah. throw enough stuff at the wall, see what sticks. Uh, you can email me at buildingmencoach at gmail.com. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and we will see you next time on Building Men.